So I want to start with this, just giving you a chance to explain uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it now in the city of Detroit. Ken, I'll start with you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I mean, I think it's time. Uh, it's necessary. Uh, you think coming out of this COVID environment, everyone's been isolated, marginalized to a certain degree. Uh, so what a perfect time to show unity uh, for the first time in history. Uh, we have merged together in, in a unified effort, uh, three historic and legendary Black business organizations. And so we have now the National Business League Detroit chapter, uh, the Booker T. Washington Trade Association, which has been around since the 1930s, uh, and also the Detroit Black Chamber of Commerce, which has been around since the early 2000s. And now they're the Detroit United Front. And I tell you, uh, the excitement uh, on Monday was electric. Uh, Steve, in the standing room on, only crowd, line was wrapped around the corner at the Doubletree Suites, partially owned by Emmett Moton, and uh, you couldn't even get into that place. So there is an excitement about unity, unification, and coming around this effort to promote Black business and also challenge uh, mm -hmm. the inequities uh, in, in uh, uh, scenarios of lack of diversity and inclusion in the city of Detroit. And so we're going to do it as a united front. And so yeah. we've got a tremendous group of young leaders uh, that's ready to go. Yeah. Uh, Danielle, talk about what the agenda looks like for this. Ken mentioned uh, the inequality that we still see playing out uh, in the business environment in Detroit, despite the fact that this is, uh, you know, an overwhelmingly African-American city. It is home to uh, just so many uh, different African-American owned businesses. We still don't have a level playing field. We still don't get the opportunities that we're supposed to. Absolutely. And that is what we are going to do. We are going to be the, the Detroit United Front is going to be that pillar, that point of reference that individuals can go to, that they know that we're coming. If there are situations where there are resources, we want to be the connector for that. If we know that there are situations where um, there are challenges within um, African Americans and Blacks not being able to be in leadership, we want to be the voice. So we are just going to serve as that voice and that connector for Black businesses. That's our ultimate goal is to just connect. We want to be able to um, you know, buy land. A lot of times people are just leasing. We want to be able to train and teach people about um, going back to our roots and, and the foundation of that. You know, we're supposed to be out here doing great, wonderful things. And a lot of times people are not able to tap in because they don't know about the resources. We want to be that that organization that's, that's going to um, be that, that bright light. And they know that we're coming and we're coming strong and we're coming and we're not afraid to stand up to whatever um, challenges may come our way. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about capital uh, because I think you can't talk about business or inequality without talking about capital. Um, uh, access to capital is is a problem for all businesses. We start there, but especially for black owned businesses, uh, this is just a critical part of the difference between success and failure. Uh, I, I want to talk just a little about how this kind of organization can help especially smaller black owned businesses uh, with that problem, Ken? Yeah, no, no question about it. And look, we're not reinventing the wheel, right? So, you know, this organization has really been a connector for traditional lenders, CDFIs, uh, MDIs, mi minority depositor institutions, black owned banks. We only have one now uh, in the city of Detroit, uh, but what we see is systematic is historic. Uh, we know since the Freedmen's Bureau was shut down, uh, by the overseers that started it, there's been a lack of trust with traditional banking. We see through COVID-19, uh, when it came to disbursement of capital into marginalized and underserved environments, uh, it was tough to connect with black owned businesses. We see that technical assist assistance is still a major impediment uh, towards capital getting to black owned firms. And so it's our job as a Detroit United Front to bring all of the banking institutions together and to solve these problems together, right? And to find a way where we can create ecosystems that gets capital to the people who need it most. Yeah. Danielle? 
Um, I'm in total agreement. Um, one of the things is I am a business owner and some of the challenges I'm able to speak, not because I don't know, but because I've been in the fire, been in the torches, and I'm able to, you know, now speak and be that voice for other small businesses um, because I've experienced it. You know, there's capital there, but how do we get it? How do we gain access to it? You know, so just being knowledgeable about it and we're going to be knowledgeable about it and we're going to also assist, you know, other small businesses so that they are able to tap into those resources to not just maintain and sustain, but to just go and grow. Um, it's all about growth and, and development and different things of that nature. I also want to talk about development, um, which is a big issue here in the city as well. I mean, we got a lot of development going on and uh, African-Americans don't have uh, the share of that activity that, that we should either. Although we did recently see a pretty big announcement on the development front, this redevelopment of, uh, of the Fisher Body Plant that, uh, that's being done by two African-American developers. But I, I feel like um, the barriers there are similar maybe to, to capital access, but, but also kind of different. I mean, um, uh, the, the decision-making at the governmental level has a, a lot to do with it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, experience getting getting yeah. black developers opportunities to to start on things and and then build a business. Danielle, uh, what do you make of that challenge? A lot of times, I see that um, a lot of businesses don't have the tools that are needed. Um, and essentially what that means is that if they're a builder or a contractor, you know, are they licensed? So it's like a lot of times they have to get the certain, you know, the tools that are needed to even get things up and running. And they don't know. Some businesses really just simply don't know what it is that's needed and necessary to, you know, move their business forward in a legit legal way. And so that's one of the things that we're also we talked about previously that we're going to also, you know, provide that resource. Okay. This is how you run a reputable business so that you are able to even qualify. A lot of times, you know, business may or may not qualify um, for certain RFPs or for things that are up. So we want to be able to make sure that black businesses are equipped and ready. And then once they are equipped and ready, that they are absolutely in a category, um, you know, and in the, in the options to be selected, to be a part of, you know, whatever building structures may come their way or whatever opportunities may come their way. So we just want to make sure that, you know, that Black businesses have that opportunity, but they are also equipped and ready um, to handle whatever may come, you know, with those contracts and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, Ken, you mentioned uh, the end of the pandemic or what we hope is the end of the pandemic uh, and its effect uh, on businesses. Of course, it had a bigger effect on uh, black owned businesses than, than other businesses. Um, talk about some of the specific challenges we see uh, rebuilding, I guess, uh, after the after the pandemic, or shoring up businesses that that maybe now are on the cusp of failing because of the the, the difficulties from uh, from from COVID nineteen. Well, Stephen, as you saw, uh, the city not only witnessed uh, a tremendous economic shutdown, um, and you think about a city that has more than forty nine thousand black owned firms based on. 2019 census tract statistics. That is 80% of the total 62,000 small and medium sized enterprises that exist in the city. But we also saw that ABC, CBS, Wall Street Journal, all the major news outlets um, promoted and estimated that 40% of black businesses either had closed their doors permanently or were one or two paychecks away. And so that's where the National Business League stepped up uh, we created programs that allowed um, for uh, uh, folks who are struggling to get grants. Uh, we launched an Amex program of over $10 million that gave $5,000 grants to those who need it. Uh, we started a program with Stellantis for black suppliers to get them access to procurement and contracting opportunities. Uh, and like I said, it's our job too to challenge the system as an advocacy organization. Uh, we obviously know that uh, structural impediments and racism exist, it's systematic, it's institutional, it's structural. And so when you don't have that voice, that advocacy partner at the table, it's harder to move the needle. So that's our job is to remind businesses that benefit from taxpayer dollars, that it's not just a charity to bring on a black company, it's that it's a necessity, it's a, it's a ROI, a return on investment, a return on inclusion, because the citizens invested in you to make sure that that dollar was returned back by supporting black business. 
Uh, Danielle, I want to give you a chance to talk about um, your experience during the pandemic as a business owner, uh, but also give us a sense of uh, how you built your business and the challenges that you had starting a business and, and growing it uh, as an African-American woman in this city. Um, well, actually, I started a couple of business actually in the midst of the pandemic. Oh, and um, wow. I did. <laughs> One That's of my not businesses... a great idea, I don't think, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know what? The thing is, is that um, with one of my businesses, I started in the middle of a, a pandemic. Everything kind of, that I do is does pretty much goes to mental health. But um, I started a virtual spa for um, women during this time. It's called Heal Her Virtual Spa. And I did this because I'm a licensed clinician in the state of Michigan. And because women were suffering from various challenges, they were dealing with grief, loss, and we were all trying to find some sense of normalcy, right? But the biggest part of that, I ended up servicing 1,100 women uh, with no, I didn't charge it was no charge attached, right? Because women were going through various challenges with jobs, with employment. And the challenge that I was finding was just, where is the capital? Where is the, the funding? You know, where do I tap into? Who, is, who can connect me to the right organizations that of women that really need this service, that are grieving, that are going through what they need? So as a business owner, I was, you know, struggling with just trying to find who is that connector? Who is that person? What's that one resource that can actually help me to grow the business? I knew that my part, what my purpose was, you know, you can have a purpose you can have a plan but when you don't have that that resource to connect you to the right um, entity is very difficult and challenging and so um, for me it was just trying to find who who is that face that's going to support and advocate for me and that's why I'm so adamant about the work is because you know I've experienced it I've worked through a, a pandemic you know I've built businesses tried to build business in the midst of a pandemic actually one of my businesses closed I had a clothing store it closed in the midst of a pandemic so I've been on all sides of it and so I'm, that's why I'm, it makes you more you become an expert through experience so I'm more uh, you know experienced now and more of an expert in this area because I've actually been through it and so you know it shows some of the challenges and it also showed me why more so I need to be you know adamant about the works that we're doing as far as black businesses receiving what's needed for them um, to be successful. Okay uh, Ken Harris and uh, Danielle Benson Great to have you here and congratulations on Detroit United Front. Thank you so much, Stephen, for having us. Happy Thank you for having us. Time.